Okay, are we, uh, are we live? Okay, sounds like it. Okay, um, so uh, in many ways the conventional wisdom about energy is that because the energy system is so enormous uh, and so deeply embedded into our economy and that almost everything related to energy is incredibly expensive, power plants are expensive, Automobiles are big investments, you know, personal investments, and so the turnover time for these facilities is slow. And at least in, in our lifetime, we think of the electric grid as basically permanent. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's that we've got the grid that we've gotten. And so there's this kind of view that things don't change very quickly. But I think you've heard from really all of the speakers this morning that there's actually been tremendous change. Uh, and it's, I think, been a surprise in many ways. And for those of you who um, weren't paying attention to energy in 2002, uh, what we'd like to do is just go back in history, imagine we're at the very early days, we're in the first conversations between Stanford University and the leadership of, of your companies um, about the, the status of global energy. And what were we thinking? What were we thinking about uh, fossil fuels? What were we thinking about renewable energy? What were we thinking about as transportation? What was the conventional wisdom? And, uh, and we have many different perspectives. Everyone here is engaged in energy in a deep and enduring way. And so, uh, yeah, so we want to start there. So, so maybe Gary uh, from GE, uh, you want to take a start, and then we'll just go down the, the, the road. Yeah, uh, so in 2002, it was actually a pretty interesting year. We were just coming out of the US bubble for natural gas, so we just built out a ton of gas turbine power plants around the country. And a lot of momentum, and GE thought that natural gas was the cat's meow and would continue. We are going through a, a trough at that point, but we, it was going to come back big. So that we we're also starting to invest in coal gasification. Okay? Um, on the renewable front, we were getting our feet wet. We just acquired the uh, wind business from Enron. And we were starting to reinvest in nuclear. OK, on uh, transportation space, you know, GE is not a huge transportation company other than aircraft. And you heard Andy talk about that a little bit. Uh, the thinking then is that uh, you know, they're going to run on fuel, aviation kind of fuels for a long, long time. OK, let's uh, Bob from Toyota. Um, in, in 2002, that was, as, as well as uh, Gary said, for Toyota, an interesting time. We just introduced a, a little call, a car called the Prius. I think Lynn was running around in, in one of them. Um, so we had begun to think about, about the future and um, more advanced powertrains. And that was, was a lot of because of something that we still felt was going to occur was peak oil. There was some work in fracking, but it really didn't seem to have the growth potential that, that we have now seen. So we were looking at a future of um, significantly higher fuel prices and the uh, opportunity, or the, that being an economic driver for consumers to look at maybe alternative fuels or other advanced technologies. So we, we saw it as, as somewhat of a bright future from the standpoint of, of our customers being um, driven to change because of the economics of the fuel. Since then, I think we've, we've woken up to say, well, that's maybe not going to be as, as important of a driver as, it, as we thought back 15 years ago. So we're now looking at, a, 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 I guess, a, a, a viewpoint where it's not as much about energy security, more about um, climate change. And how does that appeal to the, the customers that we're facing today, or that we're dealing with today? Okay, Nazir from ExxonMobil, uh, you know, oil, oil and gas. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, in 2002, the price of oil was roughly $20 per barrel. The price of natural gas in the U.S. on an energy equivalent basis was close to 100% of liquids price. We were constantly reinforcing the view that oil production in the U.S. will keep on going down, it will come out from other countries, natural gas production would go down, we will have to import LNG. Ever since I came out of graduate school, you know, the constant reinforcement was, 
In chemical facilities, you build it either close to resources or markets. And US at that point was neither one of them. So we were all mentally prepared that chemical facilities manufacturing would be outside the United States. So that was the mindset was more about peak oil supply, not peak oil demand. And all kinds of alternatives were being considered in case oil prices go up and there is not enough supply. You know, we have what I call Rembrandts in the attic worked over the years on converting natural gas, coal, biomass into liquids or converting coal or biomass into natural gas. And because of the supply patterns on each of them, we were getting knocks on our door, including internal discussions, should we activate those programs? Of course, you know, those technologies are on our shelf. What I don't like about it, what we don't like about it, is the price point and the environmental footprint. And broadly, coming back to the topic of our discussion, I would say energy options, given its importance from a long-term perspective, we were finding that not enough attention was being built put in to develop energy options, which is why the dialogue around GSEP got started in 2002, which is how do we get more low greenhouse gas energy supply options into our mix, which are transformational and breakthrough in nature and have a time scale of 10 to 50 years. So that's kind of the landscape under which we were in 2002. All right, Ian from Schlumberger. So, uh, so continuing from the, uh, the service sector side, if I take myself back to 2002, uh, I was in Cambridge with Schlumberger uh, looking after our drilling and production research facility there. And obviously our, our focus at that time was the next generation of drilling tools, the next generation of uh, production enhancement. Uh, but we started to hear um, murmurings of uh, and what can we do to impact uh, this climate change discussion that's going on. How do, how do we as a technology organization impact that? Um, so we started to look at uh, what is close to home for us in terms of technology, geothermal energy. You know, there's a lot of drilling for geothermal, they pump a lot of fluids. So we start to look at research there, carbon sequestration. We sequester fluids daily, that's what hydraulic fracturing is. Um, so we started to think, how do we explore programs to, uh, to exploit our skills and technologies in these areas. And uh, at that time, we really didn't have the internal expertise. And so that's really what led us to kind of reach out to, uh, to Stanford at the time and, uh, and look at, um, can we get a group together that can explore this? I think it was originally envisaged uh, it would be a much smaller scale than it's grown to today at that time. Um, but I think you know, if I look back to 2002, realistically, uh, we were just starting to look at what else we could do outside of the conventional oil and gas space. But the bulk of our focus was still very much on the conventional hydrocarbons. OK, so Steve, uh, with DuPont at the time, uh, engaged in, in uh, chemical production materials. Uh, how were you looking at this? Well, the, uh, in 2002, I think the, the uh, prevailing conventional wisdom was that photovoltaics was always going to be too expensive to stand on its own, that electric vehicles are never going to be mainstream, that batteries are always going to be too expensive and too difficult to be involved in mass storage. And as the, the guy in charge of materials, I looked at those conventional wisdoms and I said, that's where money's going to be made. Because whenever everybody thinks it's over here, the actual money is going to be made by changing that conventional wisdom and moving it over there. And when you looked at those problems, what we saw was most of the solutions needed to be found in the materials. That these were not sort of magic beans kinds of solutions. This was material science, and that's what we were good at doing. So fast forward a little bit and, and look at what's happened. We've all heard those conventional wisdoms, and we've kind of lived with, with the implications of the change, and Lynn gave some really nice statistics on that in terms of cost reduction. In 2002, the belief was, yeah, solar is going to happen. We expect there by 2030 to be about 92 terawatt hours of photovoltaics worldwide. Where were we in 2015? I think the number was about 275 terawatt hours. Zero electric vehicles on the car, or sorry, on the road, 
in 2002. I think last year we just surpassed two million globally. Energy density has gone up in batteries. Price has gone down in batteries by extraordinary measures. This is what happens when you, you buck the conventional wisdom and when materials companies decide that they're gonna put a focus on changing these things. Okay, good, a pitch for materials. We like that here. <laughs> okay, Jim, um, so the bank, you know, energy is really a, a lot about finance. We, you know, we heard from our last speaker that you know, getting money to where it's needed to support this. What, what was the you know, uh, bank finance for energy? What did that look like? Well, in 2002, there's two things that I find almost impossible to imagine. The first one is that I didn't have an iPhone. Um, <laughs> and the second one is that at Bank of America, the only people whose job titles or job descriptions included the word environment were the people who were evaluating the risk on a particular loan application, primarily in commercial real estate, and primarily around sort of, sort of like Superfund type issues of you know, potential contamination and whether those kinds of issues would creep into the, uh, the risk associated with the loan. Beyond that, there were you know, environmental discussions or any of the kinds of things that we're talking about now uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, just like we're using our iPhones uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it didn't exist then, and it's kind of remarkable. Okay, all right, well, that's great. So let's maybe place a snapshot. A snapshot. Uh, so not too much attention to environmental issues beyond traditional pollutants. Mm -hmm. Energy, really not on the radar. Climate, maybe not so much. Um, some smart materials companies looking for opportunity in some new spaces, you know, beginning to explore. Um, a service company saying, how can you, we use our assets to try to think about decarbonization uh, uh, well in advance of, of mainstream thinking. Uh, a world of, of, of scarcity uh, in terms of oil supply, particularly in the, in the United States. Um, a car company, driving the efficiency frontier because of economic reasons, because again, oils, the oil prices are high, scarce, and, and, uh, and gas turbines, uh, a glut of gas turbines uh, on the market, uh, expecting that, that gas prices would remain low enough to support the operation of those, and thinking of clever schemes to maybe make more gas, you know, through coal gasification. So, kind of a, a paradigm of, of where we were. Okay, so, so that's where we were. Um, so some awareness, not that much. Some companies trying to think about early opportunities. So here we are now in 2017. Um, you know, now let's forget the past. Let's put ourselves in the moment. You know, as you're thinking about energy for your business, energy, environment, um, what's, the, what's the state of thinking? And maybe we'll start down the, down with you, Jim, in the banking sector. How, how do you look at this? And why, why are you here even? <laughs> you know? Well, first of all, I think it's important to remember that a bank is a different kind of an animal than really any of the other uh, companies that are represented on the panel, insofar as what a bank does is it serves its customers, and it facilitates economic activity by its customers. So it's not an end in and of itself. So we have to work with our customers. And as uh, climate issues and carbon emissions emerge as a critical social issue, we adopted a position that we felt that Bank of America should uh, do its best to accelerate the transition from a high carbon to a low carbon economy. And recognizing that we're not regulators, we're not the policemen of the world, but rather we're partners with our customers, like ExxonMobil, we're extremely uh, good uh, partners with, and hopefully we still will be when the panel ends. Um, <laughs> um, we, so what we've been doing is working with our customers as our customers become knowledgeable about uh, issues of reducing carbon emissions. We work with our customers, we talk to them, 
um, and we develop, um, you know, a collaborative effort to um, uh, channel financing into um, activities that are going to result in reduced carbon emissions. So our portfolio has dramatically changed since the days before the iPhone um, to where we're now um, financing 10 times as much in renewable energy as we are in coal, for example. And our coal portfolio is dramatically uh, wound down and it's going to continue to wind down as a policy commitment from the company. But um, we're continuing to work on that uh, financing solar, financing energy. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we, we uh, made a, a proactive effort as part of this acceleration to reach out and um, find customers like Tesla, like Solar City, and we're now major uh, parts of the of efforts of companies like that to accelerate the transition from a high carbon to a low carbon energy, and that's that's uh, what we've done as we play a supportive partnership role with our customers. Okay, terrific. Okay, so so materials. You know, Dupont was <laughs> investing in some, uh, uh, you know clever ideas that, that, that could create opportunity. Um, of course, DuPont is now part of Dow, so, so I, I realize that the context is slightly different. But you know, material science companies, you know, did it pay off? Where are we now? You know, what, what are the opportunities? There, there, there have been some remarkable changes, and I talked a little bit about some of the statistics and the answer to, to your previous query. For me, looking back on, on that, period of 15 years, uh, of the intervening years, the most remarkable thing about the changes that have happened is how unremarkable they are. In the, in the sense that uh, the photovoltaic cell design that we had in 2002 is still the design that we have today. And yet, it is about 50% more efficient in converging, converting uh, sunlight to, to electrons. And, and that's because there's been an incremental change in the materials. It isn't one development. It isn't something that's smashing new that, that's made the difference. It's really understanding what's going on, understanding how to make incremental changes, and doing it on a, on a periodic basis that drives things forward. And you've seen that in batteries. You've seen that in, in materials across the board. Um, and and I, I think we're, we're also hitting a very important inflection point which is we've pretty much started to tap this out. That the, the designs that were there 15, 20, 30 years ago are reaching the limits of what they can do without substantial redesigns. And that means new material opportunities. And frankly, it, it, it brings us to uh, your, your timeline, Sally, of the kind of work that has been done here at GSEP and the importance that that's going to have in the next 15 years of making this happen. Actually, before we go, I do want to bring up one other statistic that I don't want us to lose sight of. And Lynn reminded me of this during his presentation, which is in 2002, there were 1.4 billion people in the world who did not have access to electricity. And with all of the other things that have changed, that number hasn't changed very much. So there, there is an imperative for all of us to recognize that we have an obligation to those people too, to bring what we know how to do to, to their world. Okay. Actually, can I just follow you up with, so what are some of the materials, for example, that are going into solar cells that, that, that uh, you know, companies like yours have been engaged with? And, and what were some of those investments that you made that are now integrated into the routine manufacture? How much those? time do I have? Uh, you have two minutes. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's generous. Um, the, there, there are really two factors here. One of them is the cost of the electricity, the, the levelized cost that you get. And, and um, one of the ways of thinking about that is not just the actual price of the unit, but it's on its lifetime. So developing the materials that increase the lifetime of a solar module is incredibly important. One of the reasons why uh, photovoltaics work so, so well is that it's an initial investment and then you can pretty much walk away. There's no fuel, there are no moving parts, there's nothing to replace, so long as the module stays sound. So tremendous amounts of research have gone into figuring out both the mechanisms 
of uh, degradation and resolving them. But also think about this 12% efficiency to 18% efficiency over the last 15 years. That has been largely the result of small changes on what happens at the interfaces. How do you extract the charge? You work so hard to have that light convert to electrons, and then you gotta get the charge out. And working across interfaces is incredibly difficult. Understanding how, how to design the materials that go to the interface to have them work exquisitely with all of the physics and materials challenges that you have is, is really important, and that's where a lot of the effort's been. Okay, all right, great. Okay, Ian. Yeah. So I, I think so, one, one thing I wanted to just, just, just follow on first there is um, you know, we look at thousands of companies in the corporate venture world, and I think uh, probably 75% of those have been enabled by uh, novel, novel materials. I think it, it's such a key area moving forward that uh, it's, it was significantly overlooked, certainly in our past. And again, one of the reasons why we've engaged with institutions such as this is to get access to this breakthrough materials knowledge. Okay, terrific, yeah. So an oil field service company, 2017, what, the, what does the world look like? So again, if I could get in that time machine that I know Google X are working on and go back to 2002, <laughs> I never would have envisaged that we would have invested in a wind company or, or a, a, a mobility transformation company from a venture perspective. So for us, you know, we're sitting next to one of our customers here and we're very much driven by those on our day-to-day -day basis. And we've seen them branch into the wind and solar and, uh, and energy field in general. And I think it, it's behooved us to, to really respond to that and explore how we can play in that field. Um, we invested recently in uh, a company that's looking at uh, emissions monitoring by satellite uh, because the first issue obviously is measurement before we can look at remediation. But we certainly see moving forward uh, initi initiatives around the reduction of emissions. To us, that, that's critical. Whether there's an administration that's supportive of it or not, we realize it has to happen. Uh, so we see moving forward technologies that can support the reduction of emissions, that can support the, uh, the branch into these uh, alternative or renewable energies, and then exploit our infrastructure um, and our technology base into supporting those to serve our customers and, and new customers as well. Okay, all right. So I think when you look at uh, 2017, you know, the first connected back to 2002. And I would just maybe point a little bit about things that have changed between 2002 to 2017 and things that have not changed in our thinking. Because what has not changed is equally important compared to what has changed. So let me take the second question first, which is what has not changed? What has not changed is really tying energy to economic growth and prosperity. You referred to the one and a half, two billion people not having access. There is another two billion people who have sporadic access to energy where their economic growth is compromised. And on top of that, another two and a half billion people who have no clean cooking fuels. So, the, the focus on energy access and the focus on getting energy to people is really still continues between 2002 to 2017. Also what continues is, um, is the fact that the demand for energy services would be twice, but more than two thirds of that would be given by energy efficiency. So continuous investment in energy efficiency from 2002 to 2005 to 2010, 15, and 17 continues. And the examples of that, what we invest is in combined heat and power plants, heat and, uh, heat and electricity production. We also continuously invest in reducing our flares you know, through our production. I mean, these kind of efficiencies go on whether the price of oil is up or natural gas prices up or down. Obviously, there have been a lot of changes in oil and gas as well as renewables. You know, there has been a huge increase in production of natural gas in the U.S. The U.S. has gone from one of the importers of, of natural gas to now being an exporter. It's the third largest LNG producer. What has changed in 2017 is the number in 2002 and 3, there were less than 15 countries that were importing LNG as a source of cleaner burning fuel. And today, it's almost 60 countries. So 
the LNG business has changed from a buyer, single buyer to a single supplier to more of a um, open marketplace. And that growth has led uh, people getting more access to energy for power generation, for ResCom, for industrial sector. And uh, what has changed is US now being a net producer of natural gas and oil. So a lot of the uh, construction of materials like polyethylene and others are now in the US. So we have been investing a billion dollars per year in the US Gulf Coast, really to, to handle the new resources that are available. So it's not unusual to expect someone in Africa now moving from biomass as a cooking fuel to LPG that's generated either in the Permian or the Marcellus Basin. That's, an, it, it, that's a really amazing connection which was not there in 2002. Now on the research front and the emerging area front, I think we have taken a lot of bets in addition to GSEP on biofuels and algae-based biofuels. We have taken a lot of bets on CCS using fuel cell technology. And we are looking at how do we de-risk this technology in the fastest way and what early use segments can we apply in. And here we have some breakthroughs that we've reported in the last uh, month or two months that I can talk later. Okay, all right, transportation. Um, I think there's three, three interesting developments over the last 15 years in, in different areas. One is a convergence of regulation. I think California, of course, is, is leader in that area, but there is a, a, almost a global convergence looking towards the 2030, 2050 timeframe for, for transportation targets. Now, maybe, maybe we can argue what the target should be, but there's this much longer term view by regulators globally um, at, at that 2030 to 2050 timeframe. And, and there's actually a willingness from the auto industry to have those long-term targets. We really don't like the pendulum swinging from tough regulations to no regulations. It's impossible, as, as most of, I, I think, our industries here, for us to react that quickly. We need 10, 20-year, 30-year certainty. So that convergence is very important. And the companies themselves are looking at these long-term um, internal targets as well to improve efficiency. The second is, is the technology. I'd mentioned the, the Prius that was, was just birthed, so to speak, um, in, the, in the early 2000s. Um, we, as a company, have expanded to, I believe, 13 or 14 hybrid models. We have fuel cell vehicles. We have plug-in vehicles. The industry itself has grown. Uh, the OEMs are offering a huge range of alternative fuel uh, vehicles now. And, and I think that's, that's expanding quickly. The, the challenge, though, I guess the third point is I'd like to make is, is the consumer. We have a diversity of consumers across the U.S. and across the world that is, is a challenge to create one technology for them. We really need to develop a portfolio for the, the needs and, and wants of consumers around the world. And that gets to be extremely costly. We're, we're all resource limited. So to, to provide this, this range of vehicles, powertrains, uh, particularly ones that are cutting edge that aren't relying on past technologies is, is a challenge for, for all of us uh, global scale companies to be able to um, meet the needs. And it's beyond just the, the fuel efficiency, but you know, there's automation, there's safety, there's um, just the features uh, consumers are looking for that it really becomes a, a, a uh, challenge for the entire industry to satisfy the expectations of, of today's consumers globally. Okay, all right. Well, first of all, I'm no longer a GE. Right, so yes. I'm, I'm yep. speaking as a shareholder versus an employee, <laughs> so I do still pay some attention. But power, power generation, yeah, power lots gen. of approaches of so, power generation. So what's happened? Well, uh, coal kind of gone. Nuclear, much less investment than in 2000 and early 2000s. Continued big investment in gas turbines, combined cycles. A lot of progress has been made, incremental, incremental, you know, from mid 50% efficiencies to low 60s, from $1,100 a kilowatt to five to $600 a kilowatt. So, and then you combine, you know, still low price uh, gas. Uh, so, Big there. Uh, wind, GE continues to invest a lot in wind. I'm seeing that they're, they're finally going offshore in, in a big way. 
so onshore, offshore, and no one anticipated wind being three or four cents a kilowatt hour today, like solar. I mean, it's, it's game changing. And then uh, we're much bigger, GE is much bigger in oil and gas than they were 15 years ago with the acquisition of Baker Hughes. Um, I think what they're focused on is what Andy said, you know, differentiated solutions to things that really add value to that space. And uh, there's lots of great GE technology that can, can help that industry. And then aviation, there's been two generations of aircraft engines since 2002, each one about 15% better in fuel burn. And today's engines cost less than, than the engines of 2002. So a lot of progress, a lot of it incremental, uh, to, to Steve's point there. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm more optimistic about the future today than I was 2002. The problems seemed really, really big in 2002, and there's just been a remarkable amount of progress. And I don't see any reason it's going to stop. No. Yeah, so just enormous change right here. So looking inside the hood, a little bit of that change. Basically, fundamental shift in energy finance to renewable energy. Uh, materials company who made early bets now looking at the next materials frontiers. An oil and gas service company looking at a much broader and diversification of services, focusing on, on monitoring and, and mitigating environmental impacts of hydrocarbon production. Uh, basically the world of oil scarcity and gas scarcity to oil abundance uh, and gas abundance and, and, and completely new supply chains spreading around the world. Uh, to a transportation sector filled with a whole diverse set of choices for, for people and, uh, and basically real advances in, in the energy conversion technology across the board. So, so when people say that the energy system changed slowly, don't believe it. <laughs> so, so now, I mean, this is an audience mostly of technologists and, you know, they really like to kind of, you know, and, and again, when you work really far out in this 10 to 50 year time frame, um, you know, sometimes it feels like you're not making a lot of progress. So what I was hoping that those of you who want to volunteer to do this, if you could look at the origin of these big changes, you know, what were those technical innovations that probably happened a long time ago? They probably happened in the, in the you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. What were those things that enabled us to have this rapid progress from 2002 to 2017. And just whoever you know, wants to speak up, yeah. yeah. Okay, I guess I'll start first as the uh, tra traditionalist. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think there's three key areas that, that we have seen you know, technology progress um, that has been driven by you know, research from both you know, the service companies and, and the operators and universities. Uh, in the prior 20, 30 years. I think the first one is in reservoir characterization. Uh, the, uh, the advent of 3 and 4D seismic has really enabled um, operators to truly home in on the uh, productive nature of the hydrocarbons in those reservoirs so that the wells are drilled efficiently. Um, and again, efficiency will be a topic we come back to repeatedly here. I think the second is drilling technology itself. Um, you know, directional drilling has been around a long time, but the, the, the ability to steer and rotate at the same time may sound like a simple problem, but is very difficult to do from 25,000 feet away. Um, and the fact that you're hitting a, a reservoir that's you know, a quarter of the size of this room from that distance, um, the telemetry, the high temperature electronics, the materials challenges that you all face to be enable you to do that, uh, that led to those uh, wells that can be drilled horizontally. And that obviously led into the, uh, the, the shale boom and, uh, and hydraulic fracturing. And uh, again, hydraulic fracturing started, I believe, in the 40s. Um, but again, the recent advent of the ability to use less water, less propant, less material, and then monitor those fractures in real time so they don't grow out of zone and they don't grow into aquifers. I think those have been the real technology challenges. And again, you know, it's all in the subsurface, which you don't have any GPS. It's really difficult to navigate in. Okay, and any other? I guess I would, I would just, in addition to talking about specific technologies, I would talk about the platforms and the mind faces that are more productive today than 20 or 25 years ago. What I mean by that is um, 
is really clearly material science and all the innovations that have gone into material science have affected almost all energy, whether it's oil and gas, in terms of drilling and others, or solar. So the, the mind phase of material science continues to be very productive. The second mind phase is the mind phase of data science. You know, it's continuous progress towards uh, converting our businesses into digital businesses, okay? And in that space, the overall trend, I would say, is hardware is replaced by dedicated software. Dedicated software is replaced by fog or cloud. This has tremendous implications about how we build our assets, how we run our assets, and the energy footprints of those assets as well. And the energy footprint of all the information that you can access from iPhone and others. And the third productive in, in, um, interface is biological sciences. You know, some people say biology is today's physics, okay? And I would not say that too loudly because there are lots of physicists here. But if you look at a lot of the inventions and the breakthroughs that are occurring that we in fact have enabled some of them, like in algae, it was because there was inventions occurring in adjacent fields, like CRISPR, for example, and then applying it to the problem at hand. You know, that's what led to our most recent invention where we doubled the, lip, the oil productivity from algae while keeping the yield same, okay? So I think these, for us, when we look at our problems, we also look at what are the mind faces that are productive and how we can bring them in because these mind faces are solving problems across many different industries. And there are some industries which are higher, are earlier users of this technology than us and then we can bring them in. Okay, yeah. I'll add one more. Um, so a common enabler for gas turbines, aircraft engines, LNG compressors for GE has been high performance computing. And it's impact in the last decade that's allowed us to incrementally make improvements. And I think that's gonna have an even bigger impact going forward because as you approach those second law limits, it gets harder and harder. So you really need the microscope that you know, these simulations now are, are believable, right? And they're, and they're proven. And uh, it's gonna have a big impact on efficiency and cost out in our next generation product, GE's next generation of products. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. do you want to? Let me, let me add, add to Gary's point, and, and despite the, the praise for materials that Ian and Nazir have, have heaped on, um, uh, in my reality, it isn't so much the materials that have led the way, but it's been the modeling and also the ability to do microstructure analysis that's been able to tell us what we've actually accomplished so that we can model it, see how to make it better and actually approve on it uh, experimentally. Just by, by way of a, of a trivial example, nano composites have been around for centuries and craftsmen have known how to harness them in order to make what they wanted to make. But until we knew what it was we were making, we were not able to actually convert what is nanotechnology into nanoscience, which is where we are today. And it's the modeling and the analytical capability, the seeds of which, all of which were laid 20, 25 years ago, that are now incrementally better and, and being brought to bear on these incredibly difficult problems that serve the industries. Okay, Bob, yeah. I'll just add to Gary's comment about high performance computing. From someone that knows how to work on a carburetor and actually point ignition, um, where we're at today with, with the internal combustion engine is, is incredible. Um, I mentioned the, the Prius, the first generation Prius earlier. Um, the, the computers on the new Camry, the basic gasoline Camry is achieving nearly the same fuel economy that the hybrid Prius did 15 years ago. So the, the ability to take um, traditional gasoline combustion and control it through ignition, through fuel, through the, the, some of the unique combustion processes, combustion cycles we use, is, all of that is based on extremely powerful, fast computing. And when you look at moving forward, whether it be hybrids or, or other technologies, that computing is only gonna grow and become more significant for to achieve the types of um, emissions reductions and, and um, performance that is, is expected from the customer. 
Okay, all right, well that's fascinating. So all of you, you students who are working on simulation, new algorithms, machine learning, um, you know, here, here you go, uh, a, good, uh, a good case for that. Um, okay, I'd like to shift now to uh, another topic. And so all of you in, have been involved with GSEP for different, differing amounts of uh, periods. But what I'm curious about is that how has participation in the GSEP ecosystem, you know, which is uh, our community, our students, our faculty, you as peer, as peer, you know, industrial sponsors, how has this changed your thinking, your strategic thinking about <clears throat> positioning your, your companies uh, in, in a world of this, you know, rapidly evolving energy landscape? And, and I'd like to start with Jim, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Uh, w when we first joined GSEP, it was uh, intended to be a demonstration of our commitment to accelerating the transition from a high carbon to a low carbon economy. And we felt that the work being done at GSEP was a really you know, good place to do that. And it was um, something that could you know, we could be putting our money where our mouth is type thing. Um, over the course of our participation in GSEP, our uh, from our CEO to our senior management team have had the opportunity to interact with experts at Stanford and had you know, some uh, excellent workshop briefings on climate science, um, on uh, energy, the future of energy, some different alternatives, whether it's solar, wind, uh, nuclear, uh, what have you, low carbon energy alternatives. And that educational process literally transformed the orientation of Bank of America on these issues. And um, people who were previously focused on just you know, the bottom lines coming out of uh, their various customers really began to think of Bank of America with its uh, ability to deploy capital across the economy, uh, both on our own and with partners to um, have an impact on, um, on, this, uh, on, on these issues. And they personally took it on with a personal understanding of, of the issue. So we, got, we didn't get any new gizmos uh, that our company is going to use uh, in our business uh, as a result of the work, uh, at least not that I'm aware of, out of the work of the, um, of the researchers in GSEP but we did get a real, a, an absolute change in mindset, a change in orientation, and a change in strategy as a result of our participation. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, what about you, Steve? You know, and you can speak for yourself if you... Yeah, I can do that now. <laughs> uh, when, when I think about what industry looks for in participation in an organization like GSEP, which I frankly consider to be a model, for uh, these kinds of interactions. Um, I, I was always looking for two things, leverage and risk reduction. And I, I believe that GSEP was able to provide both of those really to an extent that I could not have anticipated when Sally first approached me. Um, I looked at the portfolio that GSEP was planning at the time we joined, and it overlaid almost exactly onto the strategy that I wanted to have for the research organization that I was leading and where DuPont was trying to go. And that meant that I was able to do risk reduction because GSEP was investigating those areas where I, I was gonna have to invest millions of dollars and thousands of lives in going after some of these things. And instead, I could take advantage of what was known here, the collective wisdom of Stanford, which was much greater than the collective wisdom of a single corporation. The other thing is around leverage, and, and leverage, of course, is part of the collective wisdom piece. But the other thing about leverage is there's leverage of other people investing in this work. The, the, the folks on this stage participated with DuPont in putting the money in to see how these things operated. Um, and also the leverage of, of the institutional knowledge that came from other sources of funding within Stanford over all those years. We're able to take advantage of that, and that becomes transformational. At a personal level, I don't mind saying that my involvement with GSEP 
uh, was probably one of the more exciting things I've experienced uh, in my professional career because of all of the people here, the people on stage, the interaction with the companies, and the interaction with the scientists and students. It, it, it was fabulous. Great. Okay. Schlumberger. Yeah. Uh, so I think our, our engagement has certainly evolved over the last 15 years. Um, again, primarily it was carbon sequestration as our area of interest. Uh, I think uh, as, certainly as, personally, as I've got more involved in GSEP over the last three or four years, um, the ability to engage with some of the nascent technologies that have evolved from the GSEP program as have grown into startup companies um, that we can look at, invest in, nurture, bring into our business, um, that, that to me has been unique. Um, you know, we don't see that in really any of the other universities on a program this scale. And I think there's a, you know, adjacent to that has been the ability to interact with some of the other faculties at the universities that's been enabled by that. And you know, obviously, uh, as an industry, we, we move forward, automation, robotics is going to be a key element. And uh, GSEP has enabled us to plug right into the department here and see how that evolves and that helps us. And again, that all feeds back. Um, when we were looking at the impact on climate change a couple of years ago, our CTO, who's a Stanford alum, uh, reached out to GSEP to help us on our strategic thinking on uh, what is oil and gas going to do about climate change. And uh, they organized a meeting in, uh, in Boston uh, last year to set our strategic goals forward on that. And again, GSEP was a key element of that. And I think you know, the personnel involved in that will continue to help us on that strategic planning, whether it's on the broad scale thinking or some of the smaller scale, like how do we participate and what does energy storage mean for us from an oil field service company perspective. Okay. I think, I think GSEP has um, kind of changed ExxonMobil's thinking about the energy technologies, which I call the what, and also it has changed how we approach energy R&D. So let me talk about the first, the, the what. You know, it's really helped us broaden our view on the on the what's the state of the art, what's the state of the art of what's feasible. And many of the technologies, you know, ranging from Mike McGee's uh, tandem cells to um, Chris Edwards high efficiency engines to the passive radiative cooling of Shan Yu Fan. I mean, these are really step out areas that can materially change the supply and demand of energy as well as the opportunities ExxonMobil can play in. So we're always looking for integrating them to the extent possible within our own needs inside the company. So that's kind of the what. Uh, the sessions on the what uh, that we had inside about topical areas, whether it was um, um, biofuels or biomass were very helpful in shaping our views on what's the state of the art of what's possible. On the how, I think GSEP has done a really good job in experimenting. Maybe it was your drive with Chris Edwards and, uh, and Bob Wimmer about how do we engage the whole world in bringing ideas forward. And even before the specific ideas, how do you look at an area and have a broad-based discussion by getting the convenient, convening power of Stanford into, is this area ripe for innovation? Is this, if you do innovation in this area, will it move the needle on the global energy system? And can we do it? Because sometimes you can move the needle, but we may not be able to do it. And I remember some of the sessions you guys ran on transmissions and distribution, some on biofuels were really instrumental, instrumental in shaping our view of what's the state of art of what's possible and do we want to work on it. I think the, uh, the process you had um, worked where you engaged 40 or so universities abroad was quite unique and it helped us figure out where are those pockets of excellence. And lastly, your peer review system met, I call the silver standard of R&D portfolio management which is you allow the person who is rejected rebut. Uh, because you know, there are no facts about the future and there's a lot of confirmation or cognitive bias that goes into a lot of the technology decisions. So how do you get a robust system of portfolio? These were more about the how you do 
uh, how do you spend that $200 million so that you can have a maximum impact? But the results are phenomenal. I mean, there are lots of early stage companies that have gotten started and a lot of technologies are right now incubating, which will get into early use segments. Okay, so, so Toyota participated in the early years of GSEP. So uh, yeah, what, how, how did that influence well, when, the, when the opportunity presented itself, uh, senior management looked at it as a way to shake up things internally within Toyota. Um, this, is, this project was very different than the traditional research that, that Toyota had done both, both in Japan as well as in the U.S., which tends to be very focused. And, you know, they, they see, they sort of see the application of whatever research is going on. So I think senior management really took this as an opportunity to engage in much more broad research that didn't necessarily have a, a endpoint or a, a application, but to get people to think outside of the box. And I think it was interesting. I, I was talking to Chris Edwards a little earlier about one of his discussions with some of our scientists with his advanced combustion work. And one of the responses he, he remembers is, is that the, this particular Japanese scientist indicated, well, we don't think that way. And that was, that, was, that was like, okay, that's, that's the type of barriers that, that the company was trying to internally break down with this, this participation in, in GSEP. And I think in addition to that, there was a, a large risk reduction as well, to be able to look outside of our own technologies, look at um, biofuels, look at um, advanced hydrogen production techniques, uh, you know, power gen, a variety of other fields and technologies that may not directly affect us today, but could very much affect the auto industry going forward. So that risk reduction, that almost um, investigation, that insight provided in, uh, from, from the program was, was ultimately very helpful for the strategic uh, thinking within both North America Toyota as well as global Toyota. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I just, I just, first of all, I'd say ditto to yeah. everything the panelists have said. I'd add two, two okay. more. Um, I loved when you sent quarterly the researchers from mm -hmm. Stanford to meet with the GE researchers. Mm -hmm. I think that really helped develop a, a great peer-to-peer -peer network that wouldn't have existed otherwise. And then the second one was, uh, you always helped me recruit, Sally, when I, when I came. <laughs> and every, I made a... I made a point of always trying to hire three or four really great Stanford students into GE every year, and that and that over time will pay off in a big way. So, thank you. Yeah, in in retrospect, everyone was very jealous of all of those students you hired from Stanford. <laughs> Yeah, I've had many other, well, why weren't we doing that? I, like, I don't know. Yeah, so Gary, uh, with his pizza parties, and uh, bring, bring your resume, and, uh, and let's talk. So that was great. Okay, well, well that's, uh, that's fantastic, and, and, and really interesting, I think, for all of us to hear this, because we wonder, you know, this was, GSEP was a unique experience, or experiment, you know, bringing together leading energy-related companies together with this incredibly rich and diverse community of, of, of scholars. That, that we have here, and um, and I think it's paid off in, in a really amazing way. Um, so we have just a, a very little bit of time, but I, I thought it would be just super fun to look forward 15 years, uh, and and we can all be wrong together. But let's imagine what 15 years in the future might look like, and just if you could each just offer one idea quickly, and uh, yeah. So I don't know, Jim, do you wanna, do you wanna take the leap? What, what's your 15, 15 years forward from now? I think the potential of, of partnerships between the private sector and academia is an untapped resource for the country and the world that uh, is hung up on um, sort of the academics fear that capitalism is going to somehow pollute academia, and on the on the capitalist side that academics are theoretical and not practical, and if anything disproved that, it's GSEP, and um, I think that getting a better understanding of of how these partnerships can work while maintaining academic integrity, academic freedom and maintaining the capitalist system because that's the system we live in and it's what moves capital is return on capital and that's not gonna change. So I think if we could 
work on that and, and garner the um, incredible symbiosis between academia and the private sector, I think that the challenges that the world is facing in energy, but also in water, hunger, poverty, and whatnot, I think that uh, far more progress could be made, and that's my hope for the next 15 years. Great, great, yeah, Steve. I, I think in, in 15 years time, we're going to both recognize and act on the interconnectivity of everything. And, and I don't necessarily mean the internet of things. What I, what I mean is that water, food, energy, soil, resource abundance and, and shortages, these are all things that are connected together. And, and our future, I think, is going to be connected to um, the sensors, the modeling, the data management, uh, the, the on-site energy sources and, and the cost of all of these things, it's going to allow us to bring all aspects of these things together so that we can optimize where we are, not throw stuff away, not throw energy away, not throw water away, but really optimize and recycle, reuse, and, and limit the amount of use so that uh, we're, we're in a much more sustainable world. Okay, Ian. Uh, so I think I was one of the few people that went to see the new Blade Runner movie. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and I think, uh, I'm not sure I liked their future, but I think the one thing they did get right is the importance of artificial intelligence. Um, and to us, the evolution of uh, cognitive equipment and the use of the, the huge you know, petabyte, exabytes of data that we generate and being able to harness that into you know, true artificial intelligence in the energy service domain. Yeah, so I would, I would just say that you know, we'll need to continuously march down the path of implementing technologies that are available today, which are mature and a lower price point, whether it's energy efficiency, supply, or reducing emissions. But we'll also need to invest in a broad portfolio to get to what I call deeper decarbonization options for lower greenhouse gas. And in a summary, these options will clearly be a lot of energy efficiency, a lot of lower greenhouse gas energy supply, whether it is solar wind continuing down that march, but maybe geothermal with all the improvements that are coming in unconventional gas. It will be enablers like energy storage and don't count out um, you know, sort of flow batteries and other options which are what I call the shale gas of today, which we had counted out 10 years ago. Um, it will be a lot of lower uh, sort of negative carbon solutions. I think someone talked about that before. You know, there will be a lot of focus on negative carbon solutions. Can we get them back? And one of the mind phases, which are very productive, that hope we can look in the next five, ten years to see if we can get nuggets out of that, is plant biology. A lot of plant biology improvement coming because of genetics and the way you could sequester a lot of CO2 and keep it there. And the last one is none of the above. It's a surprises that are going to be there. So every time we talk about this, and we are on a round table like this, I said, keep two chairs empty. Because five years from now, there will be two other participants there that you had not anticipated. So those are my five categories that I would watch. OK. I think that what we've seen with GSEP over the last 15 years, this interdisciplinary collaboration, that's going to be necessary in the industrial level for success. The, the problems are getting so challenging that we're, as industries, going to have to pull together all the different technologies, work together um, with the brightest minds in, in the different fields to, to accomplish the challenges that are, or to, to achieve the, the, um, the technology that's going to uh, accomplish the uh, challenges that are ahead. And I, I like to point out the when we look at AVs, automated vehicles, the different technologies involved with those vehicles, and, and many of these, these technologies were never combined into a single uh, platform. So you have sensors, you have artificial intelligence, you have human machine interface, you have the, the high speed computing, you have sensors that are talking to the vehicle, you know, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure. All these things have to be integrated and you need this, this variety of uh, different disciplines working together effectively. And what the students here are learning at GSEP and other universities on programs like this are key for the success um, of industry moving forward with these, these massive challenges we have in front of us. 
Okay, what about you? Well, continued improvement in energy storage. You'd like to see a factor four reduction in battery cost a decade from now. Okay. Uh, dispatchable renewables, mm -hmm. right? Things like maybe geothermal or biofuels. And then carbon negative solutions, which will involve CO2 collection mm -hmm. and storage. So, you know, if we can get those three, we're well on our way, huh? Okay, all right. Well, we'll we're gonna check back 15 years from now. We're gonna write this down and we'll, we'll uh, follow up with you then to see what, what grade you get. And uh, so, uh, so I just wanna take this last little moment to say one thing. Um, I mentioned earlier that this is going to be the last uh, GSEP symposium, and I've heard a lot of concerns. It's like, oh my God, is GSEP going away? Um, GSEP uh, is the name, will go away, but I can assure you that our relationships with this amazing group of companies uh, and, and other companies that aren't at the two empty chairs or four empty chairs here uh, are going to continue. The planning is well underway. It's very exciting. I think our engagement will be deeper, more impactful as we see a transition where GSEP was really about developing options. And I think you hear we've made lots of options. It was about changing the mindset of the companies, of, of the university's mindset being influenced by understanding what it takes to make uh, energy systems at scale. And so as we look to the future, what we're starting to see is, is companies are starting to pick and choose those things that they think will be most impactful for themselves so that they can make those investments that, are continue, that will continue to help those com uh, companies evolve. And so, um, again, I just want to assure you that we're in great shape and our, our relationships are, I think, stronger than ever. And I just want to thank all of you for being on this panel. I really enjoyed this. Uh, thank you for being so open, uh, for sharing your thoughts, and, and for bringing your companies along you know, with, with our amazing community here. So thank you so much. So.